Hello and welcome to Spirit Plant Medicine. My name is Mark Cron, one of the co-organizers of the annual Spirit Plant Medicine Conference here in Vancouver and now streaming literally around the world. So it's very accessible. But I'm really excited today of our panel where we're doing these pre-conference conversations uh, with some of the leading experts around the world in their field. And today we are really excited about our panel. We have a great question that we're, we're asking everybody. Um, and really the question is, you know, what is the role of plant medicines and psychedelics at this time of rapid change and uncertainty in the world today? And I am here with my co-host and good friend, Mr. Stephen Gray. Stephen has been traveling the spiritual and medicine pathways for 50 years. He's a writer, educator, conference organizer, speaker, and cannabis ceremony leader. Stephen is the author and editor of three books, including the popular Cannabis and Spirituality, an explorer's guide uh, to an ancient plant spirit ally, and then recently released How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World, Visionary and Indigenous Voices Speak Out. For the past 12 years, Stephen has been the co-director of the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference in Vancouver. Great to see you, Stephen. I'm going to introduce the rest of our guests, and uh, we'll, we'll get started with the program. Uh, we have the world-renowned mycologist, Mr. Paul Stamets. We're honored to have him with us today. He's the author of seven books. He's an invention ambassador for the American Association of the Advancement of Science and inducted into the Explorers Club in 2020. He's received numerous awards, including the Nat National Mycologist Award in 2013 from the North American Mycological Association and the Gordon and Tina Wasson Award from the Mycological Society of America. He's named four new species of psilocybin mushrooms, and uh, in 23, he 2023, he received the Disruptor Award from Next Med. And a new species of psilocybin mushrooms has recently been named after him, the psilocybin stametsi. Hopefully I said that right, but Paul, you can correct me as we move along. We also have Acacia Lewis. Acacia Lewis is the founder of Divine Master Alchemy and the Divine Master University, a school of entheogenic cultural literacy and applied naturopathic medicine research. Acacia is a student of Baba Kalindi Ayi, uh, which I had the pleasure of meeting and speaking with a, a number of years ago before he passed, uh, and teachers from other systems, as well as an independent researcher and lifetime student of the psilocybin mushroom. 
We also have today uh, William. I believe most of us uh, uh, go by Bill as we had our, our pre-check today. Uh, William Bernard is a professor of religious studies as well as a university distinguished teaching professor at the Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. His primary areas of research interests are the comparative philosophy of mysticism, religion, and the social sciences, contemporary spirituality, religion, and healing um, and consciousness studies. And for the past 15 years, he's uh, Professor Bernard has researched the Santo Daimi tradition, a synergistic, uh, entheogenically based new religious movement that emerged in Brazil in the mid 20th century. We also have Ismail Lurido Ali, uh, who has been personally utilizing psychedelics and other substances in celebratory and spiritual contexts for over 15 years and has been actively participating in the drug policy reform movement for a decade. Ismail is the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Multiplinary Dis Multidisciplinary Association uh, of Psychedelic Studies, which most of us know as MAPS, because that is a mouthful, and he serves on the Board of Directors for the Alchemy Community Therapy Center from the California area. So welcome to the program, everyone. It's really a pleasure to have you all here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I bring in my co-host and co-organizer, mm -hmm. Mr. Stephen Gray, who's going to kind of lead the way in the questions, and then we'll have a, a roundtable dialogue in, in sorts uh, when we hear what uh, the answer to the question is. So, Stephen, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And um, good job chewing your way through all those multisyllabic words. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so just really briefly for our viewers and listeners, the format is going to be three parts. Uh, we will ask one question to each of the participants in turn. Uh, and then uh, the second section will be an open field discussion. And the third shorter section will be a chance for each of them again in turn to sum up. So we're going to get right into it. And Mark, you're going to uh, call upon the speakers in order because I don't know that order. Um, so I'm going going to repeat the question uh, again, uh, and I want to stress that it's meant to be open-ended, that uh, each of these panelists have a wealth of knowledge, insight, and expertise that they can pretty much take anywhere within the uh, overarching view of the role of psychedelics for a uh, planet, you might say, in transition or in crisis. I recently heard the term polycrisis, and I know that sounds a little bit dark to some people. It might be hard for people to wrap their minds around the fact that the rules of the game of life have changed dramatically recently, but that's what we're doing here. We're trying to help people understand how we can participate in our own healing in a way that um, helps with the healing of others and the planet altogether. So again, the question is, in your way of understanding knowledge and expertise, how do you see the role, the best use and best role of psychedelics at this time in our culture and going forward, of course? Mark? All right, we're going to call on Mr. Paul Stamets first. Paul, great to see you again, and thank you for taking the time out of your day today to, to join us. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I want to first acknowledge I'm on the ancestral unceded territories of the Calouse people in a remote island in British Columbia. And even though the title of this is plant medicine, uh, mushrooms are not plants, so it should be psychedelics, plants and mushrooms, you know, um, just to get a little equal weight here between the kingdoms, kingdoms. Um, yeah, so my life has been dedicated to the subject. Of, you know, and I'm 68 years of age. I still feel like I'm 30, 32. I have been very much informed by my psilocybin mushroom experiences. I think we're at a time critical in the evolution of the human species where we need to have a paradigm shift in consciousness. And I think psilocybin, from my perspective, is the medicine that is, is most profound for me seeing into the future. And I think psilocybin is uniquely different than many plants and psychedelics in that it bridges cultures, continents over centuries. There's more than 142 species that are currently identified with more species being discovered each year. The fact they're circumpolar and they have been used for thousands of years uh, speak to first peoples, indigenous peoples all over the world, uh, exploring their ecosystems. Many 
people may not realize in the tropical areas of the world, Slosby cubensis is very easy to, to locate, to find. It's a very large mushroom. Um, in the temperate regions of the world, not so. They're very rare, very hard to find. Only since the advent of, of um, cattle and sheep coming from Europe to North America and the practice of creating wood chips for landscaping. Um, it may be that the reservoir for these psilocybin mushrooms were associated with beavers since they make chips. They have ponds and, you know, there's a lot of water there, et cetera. But that's just a hypothesis. What is interesting is that as rare as psilocybin mushrooms are in temperate regions are as, as common that they are in tropical regions. So there's no doubt we all came from Africa. I think that no one really can seriously argue that we did not. And with human migration, we colonized Europe. You know, migration and colonization from a biological perspective is, um, is the way of passage of humans and animals migrating from one ecosystem to another. So from the migration of humans colonizing Europe, then humans spread throughout the world. So this is why my indigenous friends here in British Columbia like the term first peoples, first peoples to arrive in an ecosystem and then shepherding that and holding it sacred. And through migration patterns, you meet other individuals on the trail of life and their friend or foe. Far better to be a friend than to be an enemy. I mean, obviously it's very dangerous you know, if you end up meeting a stranger and you get into a, an altercation, you get wounded, um, especially back in the day when we didn't have antibiotics or could treat infections. But the generosity of extension of knowledge and tools and wisdom creates a friendship that's reciprocal. And then in many cultures, the exchange of gifts um, establishes a relationship of generosity and kindness and cooperation. And that's where I think we are here today at a critical point. I think psilocybin builds bridges. And I think psilocybin makes nicer people. And I think psilocybin makes smarter people. And the research that's coming out on neurogenesis, not only with psilocybin, but some of these other psychedelics, really points to something fundamental in being able to improve the neurological health of our species. We need people to be more generous, kind, and an extension of, uh, of generosity because this is how we build relationships. Right now, we need to come together as one people more so than ever before. It is our diversity, our biodiversity, our diversity of ethnicities that give us strength because each one of us coming from our life experiences or from our cultural backgrounds bring with us potential solutions, understandings, insights, the ability to help one another. When you help somebody, and I believe evolution is not the, is the survival of the fittest, I believe it's the extension of generosity of the surplus beyond your own needs to others. And when you do that, it's just human nature for them to want to reciprocate. Because when you are in a time of need, they will remember the fact that, you know, you were there to help them. So I think we've come to a point in time that psychedelics and in particular psilocybin brings people together in a network of individuals and communities where we're all nodes of crossing on a giant network. And the diversity of our ethnicities, the diversity of our cultural heritage, the diversity of the species and substances that we use creates a unified field of consciousness that all of us can participate in and help each other. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you, that was you great. Said, Paul. Yeah, fantastic. So we're gonna call on Acacia Lewis next. Acacia, I'm looking forward to what you have to share. I've heard great things about your work. Thank you, it's a great honor to be featured here amongst other greats um, like Paul Stamens and yourself and 
Um, even our, our friend William Bill, we share an alma mater, SMU, Southern Methodist University, where I studied astrophysics and geophysics um, alongside Dr. Robert Kehoe for a sh short period of uh, four years while I was there. Now, something I will say is to answer the question, um, we need uh, to recognize the pivotal opportunity that we have as a uh, human species at this time. Um, if you've watched the UN uh, Global Summit, um, the president of Colombia got on stage, and I'm paraphrasing here when I say this, but he said that the 2070 goals uh, that the UN has will not be able to be met uh, due to climate issues, that there is a migration already taking place and that our country in the United States and many other countries have imprison those who are attempting to migrate from places where there is lack of water, where there is pollution, and where the land of beauty is now becoming a land of, of increasing turmoil and instability in Colombia. And I think this is a red flag that uh, I will highlight in my lecture, how mushrooms can help humans evolve. Uh, is not so much that um, me being a student of uh, Elder Baba Kalindi E who was uh, and is a uh, grandmaster, martial artist, title holder, and um, world traveler who worked with many different African species of psilocybin mushroom um, in indigenous settings where first people still hold the knowledge sacred and is not able to be researched uh, in laboratory environments where you must initiate into secret societies in order to access psilocybin and the rituals and implements that go along with the utilization of psilocybin mushrooms for, for uh, martial arts, as well as ethical, moral, and uh, cultural uh, artistic expression. Um, as a student of Baba Kalendi's, as a student of, of Lama Mike Crowley, uh, author of Secret Drugs of Buddhism, and as a, a traditional uh, Lakota singer, um, I, I have utilized the psilocybin mushroom to realign my goals as a human being with the goals of this collective uh, field of consciousness that Paul was highlighting. And these traditions that are paired with the psilocybin mushroom have been around um, before they had names, before we reverence them as religions or cultural uh, expectations uh, of ritual or ceremonial use. This was a human, um, uh, connection, a human fungi symbiosis or an organic intelligence, as um, Grandmaster Kalindi E pointed out to me many times, OI. And, you know, a lot of times people um, look at the emerging AI and they look at the emerging issues in the world and we look at ways the AI can solve these issues. And that's very important and a very uh, sacred task for people who are programming uh, AI computers to find solutions to big world problems like pollution and mental instability and depression, uh, which is now becoming a world problem, as well as, um, you know, depression and anxiety can leave you open to things, viruses like COVID-19. And so I would say that there's a pandemic uh, going on in the human psyche so, so much as there is a pandemic going on inside of the world. Uh, uh, as far as viruses are concerned, novel viruses. But when we look back in history, we have to recognize that the last human migration was partially made possible by First Nations people who had an agreement to see each other as brother and sister of this planet and stewards of the planet. And this idea is now becoming more popularized in 2023. However, due to the war on drugs, there is this idea that people who want those goals are hippies or uh, somehow um, incapable of being responsible in the reverence of cultivating and protecting sacred plants uh, and fungi. And I believe that the, the longer we, we spend time feeding uh, this idea that humans who work with psilocybin are irresponsible uh, and the humans who work with other plant medicines are doing so irresponsibly, we create a, a vacuum, whereas we should be providing education to individuals about the existing cultures that uh, claim uh, these sacraments as a, a sacred tool or technology from Africa to Tibet 
uh, to India, uh, to Australia, to Mexico, to Peru. Um, there are so many cultures and the mushroom is so old in respect to the human uh, uh, physical form, um, going back maybe 20 million years, 200 million years, uh, potentially, or even, even longer ago, uh, the psilocybin mushroom was here on this planet. And so we need to take into consideration that uh, it was here in a manner of speaking before we really evolved and has been here as a tool to help us continue that evolution when we put our differences aside and we form a compassionate infrastructure uh, towards ourselves and the earth. We build bridges that can help uh, this human migration process take form again as climate changes, which it has in the past over thousands of years and will indeed again happen in the future so that our politicians and lawmakers can enact real change so that people who are being imprisoned now for doing what humans have always done, which is migrate, can see, uh, can be treated with brotherly appreciation or sisterly appreciation uh, rather than being imprisoned and placed in uh, deportation boxes and being put in inhumane situations uh, due to their need uh, to to find safety and shelter in these tumultuous uh, times in our world. So to keep the answer succinct, I think that mushrooms can help uh, not only change our minds, but elevate our level of consciousness and help us to move and smarter and more grounded ways uh, to make the world a better place in action, not just in word only. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Was I'm seeing a common theme here in, in the responses. So I look forward to hearing what Bill is. A, Bill is the what you go by, sir? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Bill Bernard. You're, you got to put a word in for ayahuasca now, Bill. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, come on. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the... Uh, that's the sacrament that I've been working with for the, I don't know, since, um, oh my gosh, since 2005. And, and it's, I've only really worked with it within the context of the Santo Daime tradition. And so when I'm speaking, I'm speaking from within that tradition, but it's sort of an odd, I, you know, um, the book I published, Liquid Light, is, is a, in one way, a study of that tradition, but in other, but in other ways, I'm, I, I'm, I want to be really clear that I'm not like some sort of spokesperson for it. The Santo Daime is very clear that we have no proselytization. There's no sense that we are like the one and only path or the best way. You know, it's like, and so even when we were asking the quest, question, the best way forward, you know, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I love the Santo Daime as a path. I don't know if it's the best way forward for everyone, but I can speak from my own experience there and and, and talk about just more generally um, this notion of what it means to take a sacrament, a plant medicine, as a sacrament in a regular, ongoing, committed, disciplined way as a part of a spiritual path as the essential heart of the spiritual path, right? And so that to me is is has been really crucial. And I think that there's something, a real gift there. And, and, and I don't know if it's, it's clear enough for everyone, but for me, it's like, it's always been really important. I mean, uh, this isn't the only spiritual path I've followed, you know, and I've been studying religions and mystical paths, just even academically for decades now, you know? And so, but at the same time, it's it's like, for the longest time, I was, you know, just sort of spiritual, but not religious, which I think is a beautiful, actually, I mean, I, I'm all for this, but it was, it's been, in fact, I used to remember when I first started drinking the daimi, which is the name we give in, the, in this, in this path to ayahuasca, I was going, hearing people talk about their religion, and I would just wince, I would just wince, because it's like, I sort of wanted to get away from it, that sense of being sort of, religion carried some notions of sort of like being like, you know, restrictive or or what have you. But it's been really fascinating to me because, you know, within the Santo Daime to have a tradition that is a tradition that carries a weight that has a lineage. This is a tradition that emerged from the inspiration of what the man we call Mestre Irineo, um, African um, 
uh, American, uh, almost seven foot tall, deeply beautiful, powerful healer, um, son of slaves. And he was inspired by his contact with indigenous and um, vegetalista versions of, of ayahuasca use in, in Brazil. But he, it was his, his own sort of inner revelatory experience that sort of said, you know, that, that in essence sort of brought the Santo Daime as a specific religious path into this world. And so it's a path that has a, a tradition and a weight, right? And so within that, when, when you enter into a path like that, a lot of it has to do with a sense of, you know, how does your ego meet a tradition that you, you are not in control of? Right. And so it becomes a, a way in which you can in the Santo Daime, it's it's very collective. Everything it's it's like and, and the rituals happen in a very you know rigorous, disciplined, ongoing way in which there's a, a regular immersion of these high frequency states of energy and consciousness that I think are because it's my deep, profound belief that you know we're here on this planet to open ourselves up into that divine light that's a source of everything. And that's what, you know, um, there's all sorts of things like, well, why would we do this? But to me, it's like I was speaking to a couple of the elders in the Santo Dami tradition, and they were going, you know, there are really, you know, two main goals in the Santo, in, in, within the Santo Dami tradition, but I think it's more applicable to psychedelics in general. And the one is to awaken to our own divinity, to our own divine nature, to that sense of our experiential um, connection to that divine source that can appear in a multitude of ways, right? And then the other thing is to how to incarnate more and more within our daily lives the energies of this that connection, the energies to my, to my mind, genuine re real presences and powers, healing transformative powers of love, of wisdom, of joy, of freedom, of aliveness, of creativity, right? And how to become more and more transparent conduits of that healing energy that, that our planet so desperately needs, right? But for my mind, we start with ourselves, right? And, and I love being within a collective setting as well, because it's not just totally inner, within the time you have these sort of alternation where you could go deep within and have that profound experiential contact not only with that divine source but with all sorts of multitude of of dimensions of reality and of different species of beings i mean literally like these non-physical beings that we can have beautiful powerful enlivening um transformative experiences with in a regular way and just sort of it and to be able to bring that inner immersion in those, in those sort of beautiful visionary experiences out into the planet literally it's like dancing singing we're, we're, we sing in the dining we sing together with our whole hearts right and sing these hymns that are linked from from the what we call the astral that come that are received that aren't just like consciously created but are like outpourings of hope and of and of beauty and of ways to sort of link in over and over again with that source we've been talking about, that sort of planetary universal field of consciousness, right? And so to my mind, that's that's the hope. That's the, that we really train, work to, in a sincere ongoing way to transform ourselves, to be more and more increasingly transparent sort of conduits of that light and that energy that to me is, a, it, that's what's real, right? And so, I think we're interconnected and we start with ourselves as that as as the real center and radiate that out and let it become just rippled out and sort of the, what we call the Indra's net of sort of each of us being a sort of like a pure radiant center of this interconnected network of these nodes that Paul was talking about. Right. So anyway, that's my hope for psychedelics. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. I, I look forward to, to connecting with you, Bill, and, and learning more because I'm always uh, intrigued when professors of religious studies are talking about this work uh, today. So I'm, I thank you for the work you're doing. And that brings us to Ismail Ali from MAPS. Ismail, the floor, the proverbial floor is yours. 
this is fantastic. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, really grateful and excited for the conference coming up in just about a month. And part of me, there's a part of me that wants to just sit here in silence for five minutes while we absorb the incredible things that were just shared by the co-panelists. I really, really appreciate where this conversation has started. Um, so props to you all, the moderators, for coming up with both of the heaviest and most expansion and most solid kind of first question to start us off with, which is like, what the hell is the point here? Uh, what is going on here? Um, and I just appreciate starting at that at that place because it allows us to get detailed, um, you know, as we start to get from a problem identifying into a problem solving kind of mode collectively. Um, so I'll just share a few things. I think a lot of beautiful thoughts have been covered by uh by bill by acacia and by paul and um you know i appreciate that acacia mentioned petro's speech the president the current president of colombia because my personal kind of advent to drug policy had a lot to do with this global geopolitical impacts and i feel like the shares here so far have touched on that scope from those kind of glo global geopolitical factors, everything from the movement of the substances across, you know, so-called borders, as well as the movement of people and the scope of that to, of course, what you were just saying, say, saying, Bill, which is like the level of individual transformation, individual transformation in community that becomes possible when we have a relationship with, with psychedelics broadly. And I, I love that, that scale. And I think that it's interesting that <laughs> just in the spirit of having a good representation of mushrooms, a good representation of ayahuasca, bringing a little bit into um, kind of other plants, other relationships to these altered states, these other spiritual practices. I'll, I like to say that psychedelics are the sparkly rainbow gate into the shadow. And I think that your, I think that part of what's coming out here is, and my answer to this question, I think, is that a big part of the role of psychedelics and plant medicines in this next phase has to do with that illumination of the shadow, not just the illumination as in the dissipating of it, but also the illumination, like the seeing of it. Um, and there are, there are many examples, I think, in global geopolitics where we can see the human shadow being articulated, but drug policy is a really, really solid one. It's a really solid example because it touches on so many aspects of society. And a lot of my work with MAPS and broadly in the field has been really focused on the political, the policy and the legal side of it, partially because those are the things, that's the aspect. Those are some of the aspects that are so in control by other humans. And I agree with you know my co-panelists and identifying some of these existential threats that I think our species is facing today. And maybe what I'll focus the next few minutes on, on is the threats that I see that are coming from ourselves that are really um, kind of related to or downstream of human behavior and choices. And part of the reason I focus so much on policy and politics and law is because all those 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 rules those frameworks are fully constructed by humans i think what i was hearing some of all of you share is that there's there's a set of rules or norms that are beyond our um, control as people there are you know some people call it the original some the original instructions or kind of natural law whatever that framing is there's certain things that may just be true about the universe um, that are outside of our control, that we're learning about, you know, that we're practicing in our spiritual paths and our mystical paths that we're participating in. But there are a lot of, there are things that are in our control. And I think that, you know, the current system as it operates, I think a lot of people um, act as if, and in many ways are subject to it, as if it's totally outside of their control or our control. And I think that there was like an indignant teenager in me at some point years ago that was like, wait a minute, there's got to be a way around these rules. And there's got to be another way to construct rules. And there's got to be another way to relate to them. So part of what I, I think is going on, and part of what I think the role of psychedelics and plant medicines have, is to show up in this battle of imagination that I think is emerging. I think that in order for us to believe that it's possible 
that we can live in another world. We have to be able to imagine it. And I think that a lot of systems, whether it's kind of to your point, Bill, certain like institutionalized religions or certain kind of racial dynamics or certain social economic dynamics have led to a paradigm in which people have a really limited imagination. The, the capacity for people to believe that things can be different is limited. Uh, I think about this a lot in the context of violence. I think that there are a lot of people who believe that violence and inner human, inner personal, inner community violence is an inherent part of the human condition. And I understand why people think that, but I wonder why the possibility that it isn't, isn't even on the table. And I think Acacia was sort of speaking to this where the belief or naming the belief that a different world is possible kind of gets undermined by being labeled as a hippie or an outsider or on the margin. And it's kind of ironic that people are like, that are trying to hold this bigger imagination are being, are pushed out and are seen as less serious or less realistic than other people who are, in my mind, delusionally trying to live in a world that is not actually infinite, you know, trying to have this world of infinite growth in a finite world. Like, to me, that's the delusion. The delusion isn't that we have to figure out a way to shift that dynamic. So I guess I say that to say that to me, imagination feels like a big part of this. And like for us to collectively imagine that other aspects are possible. And that means like having a visionary conceptual imagination, but also very practical. Like what are the steps that get us out of the carceral system, out of the punishment based system, away from climate chaos, away from industrialization? Like that is, those are practical, technical questions that we can't just imagine our way out of, but we need to start there. So I think that a big part of psychedelics and plant medicines is to kind of like um, erode away some of that social conditioning that prevents people from having that level of imagination. And in the political world, in the in the world of the law, which is based, it's it's kind of its function is the calcification of systems. And it kind of reinforces that over time. Um, I feel like it's particularly important because of this this aspect that like that is an area that we have control over, that we can choose to change policy. We can choose how we can do, how we design our world and the impacts of that. There are a lot of things that are outside of our control. There are so many things that are outside of our control, but the way that we actually design um, the social environment, the political environment, um, even to some extent, the cultural environment that we're in is to some extent in our control. The question is then how do we coordinate or collaborate? And this is sort of what you were saying, Paul, how do we get to that point where we're actually like, in working in the interest of each other because it's better to be friends than foes. I think that that's really critical. A couple small things I'll say is related to my earlier point. Um, you know, I, I live in the United States, I live in California. Um, and I, I thought a lot about how uh, the United States in particular, the global North, but really the United States in particular really exports a lot of its drug policy and a lot of the kind of geopolitical impacts of drug control as it exists today originated in the United States or have been um, pushed, if not actively funded by the United States. I'm Colombian myself. And so hearing Petro speak and hearing that acknowledgement in that sense and hearing someone, a leader in Colombia, recognize the role of the United States and the role of the global north in its place, in, in the impacts in, in, in that ge geological um, kind of area really matters to me. My family left Colombia in the 80s because of the violence related to cocaine in part because of the violence related to the system as it operated. And I was just reading a report earlier this morning that I think cocaine production now is higher than it's ever been. And I think that it's a, there's a reason that this, you know, that Colombia is starting to think about in a radically imaginative way what it looks like to legalize the production and sale and to look at what export looks like. There's a reason that in places like different parts of Canada, you have a conversation about what safe supply looks like, because if we don't solve some of these very technical questions, then the the human cost of our own choices, whether it's the drug poisoning epidemic or the opioid crisis or any of these different things, like those are just as likely to catch up with us and undermine the survival of our species as any of the external ecological factors, I think, that are also kind of chasing us down as we continue to try to live infinitely in a finite world. The last thing I'll just briefly say um, has to do with... Uh, the kind of a little bit more technical, um, uh, maybe the, one of the other aspects of the role, and I'll speak about this a little bit more at the conference as well, which is around what 
plant medicines and psychedelics can offer to the larger conversation about drug policy and geopolitics. Um, and this is a conversation that also came up at Psychedelic Science earlier this year, which is, you know, if you're in many conversations on drug policy, uh, the furthest that most places get is uh, a personal decriminalization of a small amount of something, just enough so that people who are addicted or with substance use disorders are not criminalized for their, you know, maybe health-based, uh, maybe biology-based, depending on your theory, um, kind of issues that they're dealing with, disorders that they're dealing with. The thing, the interesting thing about psychedelics is that, and and plant medicines right now, is that their place in the law and policy allows them allows to go further. <laughs> in some ways, they actually are carving a path. We have to solve these questions for if we're going to be taking all of these things out of the underground, what does that mean for them to interact with the current commercial or economic or political system? We have to solve that question for fentanyl. We have to solve that question for heroin and cocaine. But first, we can try to solve that question for mushrooms. We can first try to solve that question for the cactus. We can first try to solve that question for ayahuasca and for the other plants. And I think in that way, they are paving this way for us to think through some of the questions that are gnarly and really hard. And I think a lot of people on my side of the political spectrum don't want to think about. They don't want to think about the details of the market and capitalism. But we have to, because that is how the current world is operating, whether we like it or not. And there's a certain level of where, like, even though they're hard questions that people don't want to deal with, that these are testing grounds or sort of pressure testing ideas. And I think that's a little bit of one of the opportunities that we have right now. Really, really, really hoping that this allows us to collectively develop more responsibility. And I mean that like not just responsibility and accountability as a people, but ability to respond. Practical skills for ability to respond as the tensions and the stakes increase and the pressure of these geopolitical and ecological crises start to get closer. We need to build our capacity. So thanks. Great. Yeah, well, thank, that's great to bring that kind of perspective in, Ismail. Really appreciate that in this context. Yeah, a couple of times while you were speaking, I thought of something Terrence McKenna said that seemed apropos. May the best idea win. Um, so now we're going to um, open it up <clears throat> to uh, the four of you. I don't know where Ishmael or um, Acacia is. I haven't seen her image Acacia's for a while. Acacia's but... here. She just says her. There she is. Oh, okay. Hi again. Better okay. So off. for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we're just going to, uh, Mark and I are going to step back and leave it to you folks. Um, so, you know, just speak up or raise your hand or something and, you know, ask each other questions or add comments to anything that you've heard or that you wanted to say and didn't get to. All righty. Go for it. I'll begin. Um, I just want to, begin by saying what a joy it was to hear from such diverse perspectives. And I feel like I'm already um, really looking forward to the conference in the sense of being able to feel myself expanded and stretched. And um, and I want to just give my thanks for the profound work each one of you are doing to in your each of us in our own way. You know, I, I just I've just been really struck already about the value of you know, diversity, the value of plurality, of these different sort of prismatic views on this question, you know, and for each one of us to, you know, offer our hearts and, and what we really care about and our expertise and our longing and our, what we feel we're here to do. And it's just, it, it just really, um, I, I, I feel, I feel very um, inspired by this and, and appreciate that diversity. And, and, and more specifically, I wanted to, one 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 thing that Ishmael was saying that was sort of sparking me is saying I love that notion of the that these these uh, substances are this one the sparkly rainbow gate into the shadow. Come on, that, that that's got to be like a bumper sticker or something, I, you know. And and I I I was really struck by that because you know again I can I can only speak for the Santo Dami tradition. And so with within our tradition, there's a whole notion of one of the works that the, the sort of the goals of the work we're doing is to illuminate that darkness in all sorts of different ways and then to bring the the literal the transforming powers of divine light into each other into the room and and hopefully radiating it out into the planet um to be able to sort of see within ourselves within different within our own life situations that which we need to sort of 
uh, illuminate, to become aware of, to transform, and so that we can really be agents of that transformation and, and be able to more clearly see it and 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 know how to respond as as Ishmael was talking about had that responsibility in a real guided, attuned, heartfelt way, right? That to me is, really feels important, and that's been a, a huge gift for me of of these of these um, these substances. So anyway, that's it. Anyone? Go for it. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to just comment where I, I see the underlying theme of connectivity of people and, you know, the, the planet. And Paul, I love what you said about, you know, giving back beyond more than, you know, when we have what we need to give back more and it triggers that reciprocity effect. And I think that, you know, the world really needs to see less of me, me, me and more of how can we help each other. And, you know, maybe someone could talk about ways in which we can do that because we know that these medicines, that these plants, these psychedelics, these fungi have the ability to open up these parts of us how can we then take that and move forward in in our experience so i have a few words on that forgive me i just ran into the house i'm <laughs> getting settled but um uh i was at a empowerment by shark control and ponche yesterday and in the empowerment, he spoke about how the Jonang tradition is still not recognized by the Tibetan government. And if you don't know, the Jonang tradition is the only Tibetan tradition that has the full completion of Kala Chakra teachings, as well as Shambhala teachings. And the Shambhala teachings are aspirations towards a golden era. Now, let me explain. Just like we form habits to uh, wear masks during COVID, so such can everyone form habits that are mindful, you know? And I think that these traditions, whether it's Lakota tradition, um, Ghanaian tradition, Omoluwabe tradition, uh, Sangoma tradition, or Tibetan tradition, they have different... Um, rites of passage that people take and go through so that when they initiate into these higher states of consciousness, they go back into the real world, into their jobs, into their lives, and they enact real change grounded in that position. And I think that finding, <laughs> I, I just want to say thank you, Ishmael, um, by the way, like what you said really resonates with me on a really deep level because my my mother's mo uh, father is from Cuba and my father's mother is from Panama. And I am a child of both Latin American, Native American and African uh, individuals. And so when we talk about traditions, when we talk about Santo Daime tradition, in particular, Afro-Brazilian, Maestro Irano, uh, is a really great example of someone who brought and integrated not only his own traditions, but indigenous and religious traditions together and merged them into practices with um, hymnals and songs that were helping people get further towards that goal, that goal of equanimity that goal of being divine within oneself. The traditions that my teachers came from, um, Kalindi E in particular, the Tamarian tradition, as well as the Dogon and uh, Ghanian Ifa Orisha tradition are very much the same. And there are aspects of Hinduism, there are aspects of Buddhism, there are aspects of all these other world traditions, but what they have in common what these world traditions that are built on rituals, rites of passage, songs, mantras, prayers, all of these intentions are to prepare the human mind to enact real change. 
And I think that's what's missing from a lot of the plant medicine conversation is that people are so willing to pay money to go to a facilitator and be steeped in the energy of someone who is chanting and singing beautiful melodies. And that's perfectly fine. But to open it up to the greater public that you can live a life that is filled with those mantras and higher vibrational tonalities and, and songs that are birds from your own heart, from your own ancestors, from your own mind, that there is an empowerment of people who work with psychedelics to connect with the present and to hold reverence in their hearts for the things that are in nature and inside of themselves so that when they encounter challenges like drug reform issues, like political challenges, like climate change, that there is a gentleness and a kind approach with uh, held inside of everything that is done in response. Because just like uh, Ishmael mentioned, it is kind of like a sparkly rainbow gate to the shadow side, but in so much that we celebrate in the psychedelic experience, death and rebirth. We celebrate uh, conquering the fear encumbered mind. And we celebrate uh, through, be through seeing very beautiful things. Sometimes we do uh, tiny little rituals after we go through a mushroom trip, take a hot bath, we'll go eat our favorite food because we're so grateful for the life that we have and so appreciative of the fear that came to teach us about ourselves. And so many people have had these experiences of transformation inside of the psychedelic experience, but don't have the confidence to treat it as anything more than just a trip. Don't have the confidence to take it and utilize that motivation to see themselves fully embodied in love and and compassion inside one's mental state. And it's how you react outside of the psychedelic experience that defines your life. Not so much the pretty colors and the interactions with animals, but the real life reverence you have for animal life. What you do in your community matters. What you do in your family life matters just as much as what you do in your psychedelic life. And what the difference is, is that many of these ancient cultures have formula uh, to integrate one's reality life, one's home life, one's psychological life and into the psychedelic experience so such that when you have these transcendental experiences, um, you come back into a supportive framework. And I think that's what so many of us are missing in the United States today is that supportive framework uh, that has been taken over in the last 250 years in this country by capitalism and uh, many social issues and the need to survive rather than the opportunity to live and find presence. So many people in the United States are living in a survivalist reality, one moment to the next, one paycheck to the next. And when you integrate psychedelics into that kind of a world, we have people who have serious levels of depression saying, wow, for the first time I realized I don't have to do this to myself anymore. And the United States is going to need to face what happens with the destabilization of the workers' economy, where people decide to do what they love instead of what they had to do to survive previously. Um, people who do spiritual work and services now have their own economy, whereas uh, in previous times and ages, those people who are just now fighting to have an economy, the seers, the oracles, the tarot card readers, uh, were considered sages uh, to early and, and first peoples, to my people, to uh, uh, the people of Ghana, to the people of Nigeria. The Babalawus are sacred to the Lakota people in my bloodline. Uh, the Hayokas are sacred. And now that we have these groups waking up and realizing that the abilities or the psychological disturbances that they've faced in their lives are actually due in part to their lineage or ancestry, and have a cultural heritage and meaning that has been suppressed and at many times assimilated out of. Um, it, it, it's it's a, a grave understatement to say that uh, our, our country needs a wake-up call 
our, our country needs psychedelics because um, we are in a geopolitical climate that requires us to look at the dark and form a really good idea to uh, to take apart and to do what the mushrooms do best, which is to decompose that darkness and transmute it into light, which is the true alchemy, I think, that the ancients uh, revered so much hidden in the psychedelic states. Oh, good stuff. That's a lot of teachings. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, hey, Paul, I, I thought maybe I'd ask you a question uh, because, um, uh, of course, Bill speaks about a you know a, a highly structured ritual environment. Uh, Acacia alluded to um, different kinds of rituals and ceremonial practice. If I'm not mistaken, Paul, um, you have been more on your own with your use of psilocybin, and I'm just wondering if you. I mean, I could be wrong about that, but I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, ritual, ceremonial use, and that sort of thing in regard to psilocybin mushrooms. Well, thank you for asking. I've been always anti-structure, so I always feel that structures were confining. And I grew up in a religious environment, a charismatic Christian environment, and I rebelled against that. I am very much feel like the soul Simon brings me in contact directly with nature. So nature is my cathedral. Nature is my church. I feel the rocks, the plants, the ocean, the stars, everything speaks to me. I don't want to have an envelope separating me from the divine, nor do I want to have orchestrated rituals, which may have been proven to be very successful in long traditions. I respect that. That's fine. Everyone should have freedom of choice. Everyone should have freedom of consciousness. I think psychedelics and the use of it is a basic civil right. All that being said, you know, we have personal needs and comfort levels. Some people want to be in a group of individuals with a structured environment because it gives us safety. There's people have done this before. It's a path that's been well-traveled. They understand the guardrails, et cetera. Um, that's fine. That's not, that's not something that I, I, I do. Um, I like to be with a loved one or a small group of people. <clears throat> I like to just throw my heart and soul into the universe and feel that connection, you know, to everything. Um, so I'm sort of anti-structure uh, for my own personal. I'm always concerned that absolute power corrupts absolutely. As soon as you put somebody on a pedestal and they become the gateway to the heavens, then they're elevated to this position of, being a higher authority, and therein, it's almost anti-democratic, just to the very nature. So what I'm saying is that from my experiences, I mean, some people, you know, it's, 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 in this movement, it's, since I've been in it for a long time, as many of you have, it's surprising what people don't know. Um, as, as an example, um, there was this, these voices that we should pay the Mazatex royalty for, for psilocybin mushrooms. Okay, so let's sort of track that down. Um, there are cultures all over the world that were using psilocybin mushrooms. Um, Maria Sabina had her ritual. And if you haven't seen her ceremonies, there's a movie coming out. I've seen three different films on her ceremonies. She smokes cigarettes. She claps her hands and she pays tribute to the Holy Trinity. I don't do any of those things. <laughs> I don't clap my hands, I don't smoke cigarettes, and I don't pray to Jesus and the Holy and the Holy Trinity. That's not saying that Maria Sabina is doing anything wrong. But it's really interesting to me that, you know, people should be very tolerant of individual choices. And this is what psychedelics are liberating. They liberate you from the shackles of conventional thinking, of, of people trying to hold you back, people saying that you have an obligation to some, some other practice when your own personal journey is indeed that, your personal journey. So I applaud all these other, you know, disciplines and methodologies that have been developed 
they serve some very important societal survival reasons. Maria Savino is a devout Catholic, but I would imagine, and then this Mexico is very Catholic, as you know, and I would imagine that part of that's a fusion of being able to continue your indigenous practices at the same time when an overriding, more powerful religion comes in to take over a society. So some of these are definitely survival mechanisms, maybe initially, but then there's a fusion of cultures that occurs. So from my perspective, everyone should have the freedom of choice. I've always said for decades now, wealth is not materialism. Wealth is having the freedom of choice, optionality. No, everyone should be given the optionality to express themselves in the way that they best is for them, that they see. Yeah. I'm worried about if different sacraments are preserved and protected through traditional structures that have been erected, you know, over time, then it's me versus them. And that's something that I think we have to make sure that those walls are not put up to preserve these other structures that have religious practices that are very different than my own personal experience of being in contact directly with the universe. Yeah. At the same time, I'm informed. I think it's wonderful. But... Orthodox religions scare the shit out of me. <laughs> hey, Paul, I'm going to I'm going to step in here because I'm pretty damn sure that both Bill and Acacia would have a lot to say about that. But to move things along, I think we should keep going because this that could be a very long topic. But thank you for that, you know, alternate perspective there. So, um, Mark, if I may, I'd like to ask uh, Ishmael a question um, to finish up this round. Uh, Ishmael, I don't know, did you, just as a starting point, did you happen to notice an article by Jamie Wheel recently with the title Psychedelic Fascism? <laughs> um, I actually have not read that, no. I, I, I can I can assume what it's about, but go ahead and go ahead and... and well, I don't remember all the details, but it was basically the, the sort of the corporate uh, capitalist greedy takeover of, of the psychedelic renaissance. I just wondered if you have any further thoughts on that. Well, I have thoughts on the idea for sure. I can I can just jump in even if I haven't looked at the article. I mean, um, there's a lot to say uh, about that, and I think it kind of ranges from the philosophical and theoretical to like the technical and practical, and um, the latter being questions of you know. And I think even Paul and I have had conversations about this about IP and ownership. Some of the points that you were just touching on, but also theoretical around like what does it mean to be including esoteric practices into a commercial structure, which Acacia, you were kind of also touching on too, which is like, we're in a new paradigm where like some of these esoteric practices have an economy now in a way that they didn't before, in a way that they were kind of incorporated within community structures. And now we have um, kind of a different paradigm of self-promotion and personal branding, which is a new paradigm, especially for some of those esoteric practices. So there's a lot of kind of changes happening at the same time um, with respect to how those operate. And, you know, I mean, what I'll say is, um, it's interesting, obviously, having, you know, working at, at MAPS, an organization that is in many ways has been at the intersection of some of those questions as we get, you know, closer to potential FDA approval and participation in kind of the pharmaceutical kind of medical health paradigm, medical uh, mental health paradigm on one hand, and then my work, my policy work at the 501c3, which is much more focused on legal adult use, regulated use, and then decriminalization, just total elimination of criminal penalties for community and kind of, you could say, I don't want to say non-economic or non-commercial use because many substances, even in the underground right now, are being sold for profit, whether or not we like it. Like there is a certain level of that kind of baseline. Um, so, and, and, you know, touching a little bit back on some of the points that Acacia was making earlier and that I was making earlier, like, you know, as the, like the conversation about shifting global drug policy is not just a conversation about policy and ideology. It's also one about economics. Um, and if we are going to move, move toward an environment where we um, 
kind of legalize or decriminalize not just the psychedelic plant medicines, but other plant medicines, including coca and its derivatives and opium and its derivatives and all of the things that people are usually scared of and call hard drugs, which are also plant based. Um, we have to have a conversation about like, yeah, the commercialization of it. Like we can have a conversation about safe supply of, you know, drugs that are more dangerous with for for people who are less educated or less experienced with them. Um, but someone's got to make them. If we're going to be talking about quality control for a product, then someone's going to make it, which means that someone's going to manufacture it and someone's going to cultivate it and, it's got, and someone's going to sell it to someone, you know? So, so I say that to say that there's a lot of very interesting questions that come up when thinking about the economics of this, um, which are very fascinating and somewhat intimidating. And I think what I'll say is one of the things that I've been concerned about, you know, participating in the drug policy conversation for some time now is because of the resistance to having the conversation about the economics um there has been some seeding of territory in the conversation so one of the reasons i think multi-state operators and msos and like philip morris and other large um kind of tobacco or alcohol companies have such a seat at the table in the federal government's policy making around cannabis is because of the dynamics that led to the fracturing of the movement related to cannabis early on and I see, I'm hoping that we can avoid that in this conversation around psychedelics and plant medicine, which is to say, um, in order for there to be a continued voice and an opinion for people who, are, you know, who, who uh, uh, varying opinions about how we do this next phase of the commercialization, the marketing and all of that good stuff, um, then there needs to be a willingness to like look at those issues head on and be like okay what what are the who are the players what are the factors involved in what the next step will look like um i used to be like many of my colleagues around the field and in the movement i used to be really freaked out by this um and i think there was um a long phase where i was like really really worried about um yeah this like kind of corporate takeover thing um, and there's certain aspects that I'm still super concerned about, especially when it comes to like Western medical healthcare in particular, especially in the United States, um, where we're not dealing with an environment that has universal healthcare, where even if you do get it into the healthcare system, that still doesn't mean it's accessible to people. So there's a lot of practicalities there regarding like insurance and so on that I think very much need to be, you know, navigated carefully and, and precisely with, with orientation and focus on detail. And there's a couple of practical things that have made me a lot less concerned in the last year. <laughs> Um, in the last couple of years, maybe. And one of them is that I actually sincerely believe that um, for lack of a better uh, kind of metaphor, um, the, the, the pirates will always be ahead of the industry, which is to say the, um, th there will always be an underground. Um, there will, I, I don't think that the pharmaceutical industry or capitalism as a concept is, and, and I, I mean that in like the, in the sense of like industrial Western capitalism, because of course capitalism exists in the sale of drugs everywhere around the world right now to a certain extent. Um, but I said it to say that like I, I don't, I, I don't think that any government ha actually has the power to stop that. Um, I don't think any industry has the power to stop that. It would have happened already. And I think that even though there may be a new layer of this kind of like commercial industrial aspect to some of these things, which do have certain concerns, especially I think spiritual and in some ways very important esoteric concerns for the power of the medicine and where it comes from and the cultural backing and so on. Um, I actually think that as long as people can grow at home, as long as territories are protected, which are not assumed, right? Those are things that can, that can change, although those are political decisions too. Um, then I think that people will always be able to get access to what they need. Um, it just may take time in different channels, but there's a reason, like, I think, you know, the, the metaphor I used to give a lot is with respect to, um, like torrenting music or like down illegally downloading music. Some people might remember in the pre Spotify, pre SoundCloud era, there were all these websites where you can download music for free, right? Illegally. And every single time when Napster got busted, three new ones popped up. And when those got busted, the torrent, pop, the torrents popped up. So there was kind of this way where, um, even if there is, and there will be a lot of interest from highly capitalized interests, and there already is, um, that that will never be the whole story. So that's one thing. And then a more practical aspect is like, unlike something like cannabis, 
which is a little bit more straightforwardly a product um, kind of economy. I'm not saying it should be. I'm just saying that's how it's immer- kind kind of how it's been designed. A storefront, you buy a plant, and then you go and go home and do whatever. The practical difference in kind of the conversation around psychedelics in the more Western therapeutic context with facilitation is one in which a lot of the cost is not in the substance itself, but it's in the hours of time and the labor of care. And I think that that's quite significant um, because what that means is that unlike you know other commodities, which are cultivated or manufactured and then processed and then put in front of a consumer and the consumer buys it, the way that seems to be part of what seems to be emerging now is that there is a like this secondary like adjacent economy and this goes a little bit to what you were saying too earlier acacia kind of this economy of people who are there to hold space and to support and that isn't something you can just scale you can't just ai if you can't just like mass produce hours of care in the way that you can mass produce a molecule so there's like some fundamental differences there and um so you know, hey, I'm, Ismail. Yeah. Uh, if we could wrap up in, in the sake of time, we've got about 14 minutes left. I want to make sure that we uh, really honor and acknowledge everybody's time for coming out this afternoon. So I, I'd like to be able to step into wrapping up because I feel like we could just go on and have these conversations for oh, hours. We could. There's been oh, so we could. many things that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we've got 13, 14 minutes left. I want to make sure that we're we're on time because uh, it's just being mindful and respectful of people's time. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody being here. But maybe we can just kind of go around the circle. We'll start with Bill. We'll go to Paul. We'll go to Acacia. And we'll come back to you, Ismail. And maybe you can just uh, summarize your thoughts. Let us know what you're going to be speaking about at the conference, what people can look forward to. And uh, we'll go from there. So, Bill. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, for myself, it's really um, what I'm going to be speaking about in the conference is 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 an extension upon what I just touched upon a little um, today, which was is that what I, I want to look begin to have a conversation about what what is it like to have that opening up in an ongoing regular. Um, very uplifted way to have these interactions with non-physical beings and to begin to understand the multi-dimensional nature of reality and and the interplay between self and other that's there and that sense of discovering like who we are in these really it's like this this sense of of um this interplay between because within the Santa Daimi tradition, there's a lot of what we call mediumship of just incarnating different energies and spiritual presences. And, and so it becomes a whole school of, you know, who are we really under the surface and, and how deep do we go and how interconnected are we? And are these beings that we can learn to establish relationships with, you know, in some ways I feel that they're like, overtones of our own deepest self and in other other ways they're extremely inherently beautifully different right and so there's this interplay between sameness and difference that i feel is really cool when we think about who are we right and and and, and to what extent you know how, how we can find our sense of you know our deepest rooting in some divine presence but that sense of also just diverse ever-changing dynamic interconnection with others right and so and how we are formed and shaped by that and how we radiate out and can influence the world around us so to my mind it's a study on how to become ultimately like a a buddha in the center of a sacred mandala right where we are really rooted as much as we can in a genuine way in our hearts and in this in this place of connection to that divine source and genuinely fully human beings who are just aware of uh, and, and engage with the struggle with people's live to live to live day-to-day suffering and willing to live at linda hand and to serve right and so i want that's that's a lot of what i i'm i'm hoping to talk about in the conference and sort of our just like what it, i think is issue or something like our power to imagine ourselves really really as radiant beings and 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 to experience ourselves and, and to develop that imagination into reality to realize it 
So that's beautiful, Bill. Beautiful. Yeah. So, Thank Paul, you. can you give us a, a real quick hint of what you might talk about at the conference? Yeah, I I really want to give a shout out to the heroic uh, leadership of the women uh, scientists and mycologists. Many people may not realize Maria Sabina was not just a healer, but she was a mycologist. She went out into the, into the mountains and she knew the differences between uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms and poisonous mushrooms. She could collect them. And also um, Tina Watson, who was R. Gordon Watson's wife. Unfortunately, she died in 1958, I think. She was um, also a mycologist. She knew mushrooms by their Latin binomials. From them coming together, a lot of us have this knowledge, you know, or built upon uh, the knowledge that they've conveyed, which is super important. So what I'm going to talk about also is the very plausible um, and strong evidence that the Egyptians also used psilocybin, uh, specifically Slosby cubensis. I recently went to 10 temples in Egypt and found mushroom hieroglyphics all over every temple uh, in the shape of Slosby cubensis. I'm not the first person, another mycologist by the name of Abzim Abdul, also uh, published on this in 2016. While I was there, I was very introduced to a very interesting group of people who are bringing now the blue lotus, which grows in ponds, a water lily, before desertification, all along the Nile, it was much more vegetation. The water lily is being collected, the blue lotus at ponds, Slosabee cubensis grows on cow manure, cows go to ponds in order to drink. So, and the golden and blue color in Egyptian culture is sacred. And common people were banned from collecting mushrooms. Now, Cleopatra was a lover of Caesar and Mark Anthony, and were the Eleusinian mysteries were occurring. So, of course, you'd be sharing the secrets. And Cleopatra actually funded the Roman army. Um, so this sort of cross-cultural exchange of information is deep. Happened in Germany, Ireland, very likely in Africa, uh, certainly in Egypt, you know, northern Africa. Um, also the, the Tzitzili cave art in Algeria. These are all very proximate to each other and the massive amount of trade that was going on. It's from monotheism, the suppression of these indigenous use and first people's use of sacraments that I think was the first war on drugs. I think we need a peace treaty with psychedelics. We need a peace treaty with psilocybin. And what I'm concerned about is that there are walls being built up between cultures when it's actually cross-cultural exchange that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm excited to show you these hieroglyphs that we found. We are writing an article that will probably be submitted to a, a journal of ethnobotany with the two other scientists. We're doing DNA sequencing now around the temples to see if there's lost cubensis of spores. We put out a, a reward for wild Slosby cubensis. And something that I've been very passionate about, I know Sabrina, Maria Sabina's family circle, uh, Inti and Guaramo, and I've been very actively in communication with them and supporting and preserving the Maria Sabina Library. So yeah. this is something that is interesting to me as well because Juliana Fershi visiting the Mazatecs because of the interest in psilocybin mushrooms and because of climate change and lack of resources, they're using Slosby cubensis now, which is cultivated. The Slosby cubensis, which came over likely with the Spaniards. So, and now Slosby as it's a quorum, serialescent Slosby mexicana, which Maria Savina used, Slosby as it's a quorum grows in Quebec. So it's interesting as we delve into this more deeply, we realize how extensive the use of psilocybin mushrooms are ecologically and culturally. And the lesson from psilocybin is to exchange information, to support each other, to, to try to build bridges and not fences and divides and to be informed by all traditions. And no one tradition owns it. No one, one tradition should be blamed. 
uh, we're all struggling, I think, on the same path to be able to achieve a higher state of being and be better Earth citizens and just kinder, nicer people. Thank so, you, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Hey, now, Acacia, I can see by your facial expressions that you, you, you have a lot to say about a lot of what's been said here. But so I'm sorry, you know, to have to squeeze you down. But, you know, in honor of Mark's uh, deadline here, could you just uh, give us a very brief uh, hints of a couple of things you're going to talk about at the conference? I will be speaking about the legacy of Kalindi Iyi, who was a mycologist who traveled to Egypt, like Paul Stamens, and lectured for many decades about Egyptian mushroom use, um, though he was not published in articles and such. Um, as someone who has practiced the Tamarian uh, lineage traditions, uh, which detail uh, the use of psilocybe cubensis uh, mushrooms, uh, for actualization of Necheru or um, ancestral deities for uh, exploration, I will continue to teach about his legacy in, in that regard, um, as well as to highlight the technology and the ritual implements that um, were utilized in crystal technologies for traversing multidimensional realms uh, consciously um, embedded with maps from one's elders and uh, ancestral lineages uh, to keep track of locations where individuals can come together and have an experience without being in the same house from thousands of miles away, um, utilizing psilocybin cubensis as a communication technology, as well as a divinatory tool. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, how mushrooms can help us evolve uh, specifically about healing religious trauma uh, and the actual roots of some of the non-dual religious uh, ideas of Aztec philosophy, which do not involve a hierarchical figure of man versus God, but i.e. God as man and uh, brothers as God and divine beings incarnate. Uh, no separation from nature being also a non-dual and an impartial force, Tiot or Ome Tiot, uh, that was represented in Aztec philosophy. Um, so I will be talking a great deal of the bones of these traditions that are, you know, at least those who represent them well are not trying to build walls uh, between anyone's practices and their own, but simply tear down the ones that we make up for ourselves in our head, which is the illusion of separation of man and God altogether. Um, so I will be educating at the conference. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. And Ishmael, um, I think we know the general direction of where you're going, but could you just give us a couple of hints? Um, I'm just gonna solve all of our problems for us. I'll just give us all the solutions. <laughs> I'll just stop an hour of solid, just problem solving. No, I'm, I'll talk, I'm, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about um, harmonization uh, not the musical kind, I'm not particularly skilled of a singer myself, but um, of just harmonization between different approaches. I think that as we have in the last few years of kind of fractaling within the field and the movement, which I think in many ways has been good. Like I like to say that we're now disagreeing with ourselves, with each other for openly and visibly for the first time in a way, I think that's very generative, um, which is starting to like put some cracks into the assumptions about the field and the movement. Um, more and more people are showing up with their like particular perspective and their particular um, um, worldview, whether that's ideological or um, or political or otherwise. And I think I'll be talking a bit about how to reconcile some of the perceived um, tensions between uh, different appro policy approaches um, with the hopes of planting a seed for a more affirmative generative and interconnected um drug po like post prohibition paradigm i think that if you look back and i'll say this at the beginning of my talk you look back a lot of people look back and they're like whoa the war on drugs really didn't work or it did work under this particular racist socially oppressive structure okay that's bad but then people look forward and no one can really agree on where to go so even if we have consensus that where we've been is not so good where we go is harder to figure out so then we're going to talk a little bit about harmonizing different approaches in that sense yeah Beautiful. Yeah. Mark, do you want to do a wrap up? Absolutely. Well, first, I just want to thank our, our guests and our panel, Bill, Acacia, Paul, Ismail. Thank you very much for taking your time out of your day to, you know, 
answer the question and really enlighten us in, in your view on how psychedelics can really help upshift the planet and you know create change for humanity it's it's really an important subject and i look forward to paul seeing and meeting you again at the conference this year and meeting acacia ismail and bill for the first time and if there's any way we can always you know support your work in this world of psychedelics then we are happy to definitely um share that with you so that we can share more it's really about getting this work out there so we can make a difference in the world and i personally in my own experience know that uh these plants these fungi these medicines can make a difference can wake us up can open up other dimensions and parts of our our lives and i look forward to what you uh have to share and i look forward to gathering together in community for what our conference has always been very well known for is that sense of community and uh, again i thank you so much for your time today and sharing your wisdom with with the community and the people around the world who've tuned in so i thank you very much thank you mark and stephen and co-panelists paul and bill and acacia looking forward to seeing you all in a month mm -hmm. thanks so much folks thanks a lot for taking this time awesome. great until next time chief reuben uh chief reuben george joins us on friday as time has changed it's now going to be four o'clock in the afternoon we're going to talk about it stops here his new book uh he'll be speaking at the conference as well so we look forward to seeing him and speaking with him he's just such a beautiful soul and has got some great things to say and share for us all to consider and of course i'd also like to thank our sponsors for making all of this happen conscious living network of course the founder of spirit plant medicine uh dragonfly earth medicine sabia cosmic sister ad lucum law simon hey duke hubcast where we are here at the studios doing this uh upscale production of what i used to call mark's amateur zoom hour and uh with theracil filament health and many of the great people who support the work that we do so we can bring these messages to the world so thank you very much okay all right okay. yeah that was great <laughs>